Hi everyone, we're back here at Kutia DevStage for the second day of COSI CT. We've got a packed day ahead of us, so without losing any time, I'd like to start with the first keynote of the day, a very interesting one as well. We'll get to hear about intelligent control systems, AI and robotics from Mr. Ronnie Vuin, the CEO of Micropsy. We welcome you, Mr. Vuin. The virtual floor is all yours. Hey, good morning. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the uh, invitation. Uh, yes, my name is Ronnie uh, from uh, Micropsy Industries. We're a uh, software company in Berlin. Mm -hmm. Um, we do um, control systems for industrial robots, and I have uh, prepared roughly 20 minutes of um, essentially a presentation where I share some of our thinking around it, uh, what we do, um, how we see the market beyond you know, what specifically we do. And um, also, I have tried to highlight where I believe the opportunities uh, in this space are, at least from you know, where we're sitting, which is obviously a, a rather uh, specific place. So um, let's start. Uh, first, first of all, um, you know, the, 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 real, the real interesting part about the hype around AI and robotics that has been going on uh, for, for a while from a business perspective is obviously automation. Everything else, service robotics and some of the other things are too far in the future to be to be really viable. So today we're mostly talking about um, so we're mostly talking about um, uh, automation today, and automation is really the main the main driver for even combining technologies like AI and robotics. Um, and uh, it's also super important that we do it, uh, not just because it's good business, uh, but also because. Um, it matters from a macroeconomic uh, perspective, um, especially, you know, most of Europe has aging, shrinking populations. Um, so um, if you look at it from a macro perspective, um, doing automation, um, essentially using machines to do uh, more with less uh, effort, um, is one of the few remaining sources of actual economic growth. Um, and uh, that's where we're coming from. It also means if we automate, uh, if we continue to automate, uh, we can continue to uh, you know, pay high wages um, in, uh, in manufacturing, um, and it doesn't all go uh, to Asia. Um, so um, automation is super important. Um, production needs it, especially in the West, especially in Europe. Um, and unfortunately, it's also super hard, and it's super expensive, and it's super inflexible. And the way we look at it, um, automation, um, and that includes pretty much all of robotics today, um, is roughly in the same spot that IT itself was uh, in the early 1980s. So you know, people are doing it. It's not, uh, it's not, it's not sci-fi future technology. It's there. Um, but uh, if you if you install robots, if you do it, if you if you if you automate production lines um, to a degree where you know can take away the humans from them. Um, you're always you're, you're almost looking you're almost always looking at uh, you know multi-year projects that are super expensive and need to be done by professionals and uh, that's sort of in the way of adoption right because that makes you too inflexible it's too expensive for most people um, and IT um, was exactly like that in the early 80s you needed to buy it from IT people in white coats came and they were experts um, and then something happened um, and what happened was. The, the market moved from um, big expert projects um, to small units that essentially anybody could buy. Um, and uh, it wasn't as good enough as what you would have bought from IBM or uh, the other uh, big, uh, big suppliers. It was good enough uh, so everybody could do it. And uh, we believe that automation is pretty much in the same, uh, in the same place. So, you know, as IT had its PC moment uh, when it became uh, available to everybody and got democratized because it was available in small units that everybody could use. The same thing is happening in uh, robotics right now. Um, and uh, we at Micro Industries believe we can contribute uh, something uh, to that change that is happening um, at the moment. So um, what's, the, what's the specific role of AI um, when combined uh, with robotics? So the, the way we look at it is, if you think about what a factory actually is, um, 
it's essentially a, a humongous machine for rearranging atoms, right? You put material in on one side um, and something that's more valuable than the raw materials comes out on the other side. That's, that's what the factory does. Adds value by rearranging atoms on the flow, on the way of the flow of the material uh, through the factory. And um, if you want to do that, and you, if you want to, um, um, you know, rearrange atoms, you sort of need to know where they are before you start rearranging them. So everything needs to be uh, properly and neatly ordered. Um, and that, of course, is extremely expensive. Uh, it's, you know, less expensive if you're doing cars because they're made, of, made out of metal and this behaves mostly predictably. So you know where your car is at any point in the factory. Um, but for, for many other things, especially if you involve cables or rubber or any, anything that moves or is slightly differently shaped, Knowing where all the stuff is in the factory is super expensive um, and usually can't be done today. And that's why you use humans. So because they're super flexible, they just um, you know, look at something and will know where to pick it up and how to handle it. Um, so robots couldn't do it uh, because robots, or as any other machine, uh, they're just a bunch of electrical motors and software, and they need to know exactly where something is that they're supposed to handle or manipulate. Um, so today, uh, many factories, even in high wage countries, still use humans to sort of allow a bit of disorder to happen because that's cheaper and then use humans to find back and have them sort something from just a heap of stuff into a machine where it's neatly ordered and can be, uh, and can be processed. Um, so today you use humans and uh, if you want to move away and automate further, um, you need to use more flexible, flexible machines than specialized machines that can just do one thing, so that's robots. And you need to use a technology that's as flexible as humans to you know, understand the state of the material that's coming towards the uh, processing station and deal with it. And that would be AI. So this is why this combination of AI and robotics is so exciting, uh, because it allows you to essentially automate further beyond what you could do uh, before with the new technologies that um, you know, came into being in AI over the last uh, 10 years. So um, I apologize for this slightly boring slide. Um, it's, at least it's boring looking, uh, boring looking, but it's really packed with um, you know, a way of systematizing what's, what's, what's happening uh, in the field. I will just go through it. Um, and uh, as this is online, you can maybe in parallel Google the companies that I have um, put in examples and look at uh, what they're doing. So um, on, the, on, the, on the left here, I have um, uh, the types of uh, robots where uh, we see major innovation uh, currently. And um, I mean, let's start. Let's start from the bottom um, with you know highly specialized machines. This is mostly mostly drones. So these are um, machines that are essentially custom built by robotics companies um, or um, produced at you know small scale for highly specialized applications uh, like nuclear decommissioning, um, space applications where you have things that you can put in the ISS and would manipulate something there. Um, some of the inspection cases, um, and there is virtually no AI in these uh, in these in these robots uh, usually because um, everything's so expensive and so high stakes uh, all the time that you essentially want to teleoperate them. So if you do any AI, um, it's usually supporting teleoperations. Um, the you know, one of the companies that is active in the field that is quite similar to one that you have probably heard of, the one you have probably heard of is Boston Dynamics. Um, just got sold yesterday, I think. Again, um, one of the one of the companies that's um, that's uh, you know similar um, in scope uh, but with a more clear focus than Boston Dynamics has is, for instance, Ghost Robotics. And they're completely military. I visited them uh, two years ago, and if you if you go there, uh, what you see is you know oil paintings of people throwing four-legged dog-like robots into into houses so they can run around and scout uh, if anybody's in there. So these are these are these are mostly teleoperated machines um, because what you're doing is too high stakes um, and too custom um, to handle it with AI today. And then in the same field of lagged robots, um, the, you, you, you get some semi-standardized applications, um, mostly in asset inspection. Uh, and an example would be energy robotics, um, startup, I believe, from Munich um, here in Germany. They uh, essentially took a spot robot by Boston Dynamics. So again, something that looks like a small dog has four legs and um, is uh, you know, right in the center between being super cute and super scary. 
Um, and uh, they put cameras on top of that platform and um, they have it running around in a factory uh, and just look at things. So uh, this is mostly valuable in process industries. So where you make uh, things with a continuous flow of materials. So you don't have discrete steps. Um, uh, so this means it's mostly pipes, right? Um, and uh, you have lots of pipes to inspect. And today that's something humans do. They will just go along um, and see if they see any leaks or anything that looks worrying on those pipes. And the idea is to do this with robots uh, and to do it with legged robots. So AI-wise, what you need to do this is a bit of planning. So where do you go when? Um, and you uh, need a bit of um, simultaneous location and mapping, SLAM. Um, and for this specific use case, you need to be able to tell a good pipe from a bad pipe. So you have a, classic, a classification AI problem that you're that you're also uh, tackling. Um, and uh, you know this is there. There must be more opportunities for doing things with those legged robots that are now available um, beyond the asset inspection use case. I don't know, um, but uh, it's certainly worth looking into this. The platforms are now available. You can you know bring unmanned vehicles into rough terrain now because we have four legged robots that can you know climb a steep hill or uh, be be out in the woods uh, or be in any form of terrain that a wheeled robot couldn't go through um, and we're not really seeing the applications there um, so i think lots of people are looking for ideas of what to do um, with platforms uh, such as uh, ghost robotics or boston dynamics and energy robotics are an example of adding software, adding AI to do something useful with these platforms beyond the teleoperated use cases that you get from the you know, super high stakes um, 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 fields. And then of course, a huge fields are autonomously guided vehicles, AGVs. Um, they're mostly used uh, for intra-logistics, um, moving stuff around in warehouses and factories um, without people uh, needing to know where they go. This, again, AI-wise, is mostly a slam problem. So you want the robot to be able to create a map of uh, where it operates, and you want the ro robot uh, to know where it is on the map uh, so it can sort of make a plan and, um, and uh, um, you know, find a box of uh, metal parts and take it to a machine where um, a robotic arm will handle it uh, later on. Um, one uh, of the more spectacular examples of really good um, SLAM algorithms uh, is done by Artisans, again in Munich. They're also um, 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 active in the automotive space because, of course, you know, if you can drive an autonomous forklift around a factory, um, this use case is very close to driving an autonomous car um, around the city or at least a parking lot. So SLAM really matters uh, and Artisans uh, is a company that does this uh, really well. They have really cool demos. Um, the opportunities in the field are uh, again in um, just vertical applications. Um, AGVs come in all forms and sizes from very small platforms uh, that um, essentially carry a shelf around in, a, in an Amazon warehouse um, to forklifts. And one of the more interesting applications I have seen was a specialized uh, AGV that was able to pick cans from shelves uh, for distributing drinks. Um, and uh, if you want to do that at scale, it pays to have an AGV, uh, essentially an autonomous forklift that can drive up to a, to a shelf, um, get individual cans or a pallet of, uh, of, of drinks uh, for, uh, for, for delivery. And then of course, finally, there's the space that we're active in and that we find most exciting, um, which is robotic arms. So six uh, electric motors in metal tubes bolted to a table that can manipulate and build things. Um, the applications that we're seeing there are mostly pick and place. So you have a part and it's in a box and it needs to be put into a machine for some grinding or some further processing. And then it needs to be taken out and put on a conveyor belt and taken elsewhere or on an AGV and taken elsewhere. So these are pick and place applications. Uh, you have assembly applications where you really you know, clip things together or screw things together. We have testing applications where uh, you've done the clicking or screwing things together and then you want to know, you know does it work? Is it is, is it in a proper state? And again, um, you have applications where you just need to move stuff from one table to a second table or from a table to an AGV or uh, vice versa. And the AI problems in that space, and that's certainly where I'm most familiar uh, with, um, are, um, so we, we sort of divide the, the market into uh, two big types of AI 
um, approaches. The first one is uh, you want to move a robot to a, uh, to a piece um, or uh, to a machine. Uh, and you have essentially a 3D model um, and a 3D camera, and then you fit the model into um, the point cloud you get from the 3D camera. And then you have a 6D pose, right? Three transitory uh, um, uh, dimensions and uh, three rotatory dimensions. So you have a 6D pose for where the object is, and then you move the robot up um, to the uh, object and you move it relative to what you've measured with your 3D camera and your, um, your, your 3D model um, of the object you're handling. Or dealing with, and that's uh, that's pose estimation. Um, and then uh, we take a slightly different approach. Uh, we do uh, real time control. So just to uh, illustrate this, um, if we as a human as humans uh, plug in a cable into a phone for uh, charging the phone, we don't have a three D model of the phone in our heads, um, not even close, uh, and we don't have a full three D picture, and we don't sort of you know, take a single measurement where we fit a 3D model into the point cloud uh, that we get from our eyes. What we do is we just move towards, you know, with the cable in one hand uh, and the phone in the other, we just move towards each other um, and wiggle a bit. Um, and as we get closer, we see how we need to make small corrective movements um, uh, to get the, ca get the cable in. And this real-time control is fast making decisions from visual and haptic input um, where you don't try to find an absolute pose of what you're handling, but just relative movements that you need to make to end up in the right position is what uh, Micropsy Industries uh, does, which I have, uh, which is a convenient example uh, for a cool AI um, and robotics uh, company. Um, the opportunities there are um, not um, in the um, aid, in the in the AI itself. I would say, of course, you know, you can always beat us, but um, the opportunities are um, mostly in doing things uh, with existing robotic arms and existing AI systems that so far nobody has thought of. Um, and some of the more interesting uh, concepts I've seen are in construction or um, you know, in um, picking, uh, picking, uh, picking things in hospitals or uh, making pizza uh, with uh, robots and an AI system that can you know, handle the variance that you naturally have when you're assembling something that's made out of food, it never looks the same. So you never know where the atoms are. Um, and um, I, th I think there is going to be a whole wave of new companies, um, just like uh, you have in the case of legged robots, where um, people take existing platforms, take existing AI systems, take existing robotic arms, put them together and do something that so far couldn't have been done with machines and would have had to be done uh, with uh, just human workers. And then there's one major opportunity, and I'm only half joking when I'm saying streets paved in gold on the, on the title of this slide. There's one major opportunity um, in system integration, especially in uh, production and logistics, uh, because um, all of this is mostly new uh, to people who run factories, right? They're not AI people. Uh, they don't know what they're buying uh, in many cases, um, or they will have one person who sort of knows what they're doing, but it's really not common knowledge in the organizations uh, of people who want to automate. So um, all these new technologies are now available and you could build um, machines and factories from them, but people really don't know how to do it. And I don't want to learn it because they're running factories uh, that make, I don't know, uh, coffee machines. Uh, and they really don't want to uh, be experts in uh, applying AI to their, to their systems. So the whole market, and it's certainly true for us uh, and for the robotics guys who make the hardware, um, and uh, for for many of the component makers who make you know the grippers and and all all, all those things, everybody pretty much feels held back right now, um, and that means there would be money to be made if somebody could do it by the lack of uh, competent system integrators, people who know enough mechanical engineering and enough IT to be able to go into a factory, deploy these systems, um, um, get some money for it, and then do it again uh, for, for, for somebody else. Um, pretty much the whole market is frustrated because um, too few people know how to do it and can actually uh, pull it off and do it reliably. Okay. Um, and then um, let me just uh, show you some of the things that are possible now. Uh, at least one demo I have brought here. That's, it's a Micropsy Industries demo. Um, 
to, um, and it sort of highlights uh, the specifics of uh, what we're what we're doing. Um, the only reason to um, not do what we're doing, uh, which is real-time control over the pose estimation, is that you uh, can't, and it's sort of easier to do that. So here uh, in this demo, we have like six wine glasses just on a table. They're in a rough order, but really nobody has ever measured where they where they are precisely. And those large movements that you see the robot make uh, through free air until now are all pre-programmed. And now this um, uh, tender picking up of the glass, this finding exactly where the stem is, and then ordering it um, on the on the on the on the other side as it puts it down. This is driven by our system. Uh, if I can I pause this? Yeah, I can pause this. So uh, if you if you if you look at this at the assembly here, you have um, um, a small robot by Universal Robots. Then you have a gripper by Robotique. Um, and then uh, this contraption here, this is a camera and a 3D printed uh, camera fixture. Um, and this camera is essentially um, uh, driving um, the uh, real-time movement that we're making here. So at 20 Hertz, this camera will shoot images, um, deliver the pixels to our AI system that has been trained by a human um, to, um, to know how to move. Um, and then guide the robot 20 times a second with new uh, instructions for the robot joints um, how to uh, how to move and that allows you to be super flexible so you don't you know if you this is a real application somewhere in not in this file um, if you have a, a company that makes those glasses um, and they are just on a conveyor belt but they're sort of semi-ordered they're never uh, in the same place uh, even if you have a hard computer vision problem like this, where you have reflective and translucent surfaces, um, you can um, pull this off and uh, pick these glasses up and put them in order uh, on the other side. The application, by the way, has been trained by salespeople. So this is not something that we custom built uh, for, uh, for this client. It is really just a product or system um, that somebody trained uh, to perform this and training in this case means generating the data, which means guiding the robot by the wrist as you would guide a human. This is how you pick up the glass while the camera is watching and you do this for two afternoons and then you'll be able uh, to do uh, what you're uh, seeing here. I'll just let that play out. Um, yeah, the, the range of applications is really um, you know, from picking glasses to testing refrigerators um, to putting uh, metal rings into machines. Um, we're really, you know, what a robot can do and where you have a bit of variance that you need to deal with, uh, you can train um, our system uh, to handle it. Um, okay, and then um, a last word on the economics of it all. Uh, if you do anything like this, um, and you're, if, you're, if you're active in the field of um, AI-driven uh, automation, it's very easy to get carried away because, by you know, what, um, what the industry has been doing for the past 40 years. Robots have mostly been bought by uh, automotive and um, to a slightly uh, smaller degree by, by uh, suppliers of automotive metal companies. Um, and then a bit of logistics. And they do these uh, high value, high number of standardized deployment applications like welding, painting, palletizing. That's where, we, where you would see robots um, when you just go to a factory um, today. So this is, this is the classical market and has been served by the likes of KUKA and ABB and Fanuc um, and some of the Japanese player Kawasaki for, uh, for many years. Um, and there's virtually nothing to be done there, right? This, this has been optimized for a very long time. It's pretty much perfect. Um, and um, there, there, there isn't much opportunity uh, in, that, uh, in that space. But what's ha what has happened over the last couple of years is that um, uh, smaller, um, easier to handle, safer um, and cheaper robots have become available, for instance, from Universal Robots, who we like to work with. Um, and they have been deployed by people who um, couldn't afford um, uh, these applications before. So new players, smaller factories or factories that didn't have any welding, painting or pelletizing applications, sort of started uh, to put robots next to their existing specialized machines to just tend to the machines, just put parts in it, pick them, put parts in it. And that already is a large market and the universal robots, you know, catering to that market um, has been growing 
um, with you know crazy numbers um, for a couple of years. Um, and this is still you know without any AI in it. This is just you know where the part is, you know where the machine is, you take the part from A to B. A and B are well known, um, and you just program the robot to deterministically make that movement. And now what we're now seeing. And that's really what's enabled uh, by the availability of uh, AI uh, in the space is that you can go into the real long tail uh, where you have um, applications that really nobody knows about, uh, right? Nobody in any research lab or, you know, on a whiteboard in Berlin, we don't have it, um, have, um, has a list of applications that um, are super specialized, that are somewhere out there. And they're essentially just in one or two or three or five factories but they're not big enough to go after um, for the traditional players who try to solve you know, vertical applications that I know about. So um, these are these specialized, mostly unmapped uh, applications and testing assembly and intro logistics. And just to name an example that I always use that you know, I didn't know existed until I walked into that factory and people showed me. There's a company in Southern Germany and they make magnets for closing rubber tubes that go into coffee machines. Um, so four people in the south of Germany make these uh, for essentially any coffee, coffee machine you can buy from a German company. Um, and um, the applications there are about inserting some fiddly cable into a, into a, into a round uh, part. And it's just too special for any of the big guys to care about. Um, so there's no standardized machine that can do that. Um, so your options are either you still use people or um, you use customizable, customizable AI and train a robot to do it with a product um, such as uh, ours. Okay, so um, this is um, all I uh, this is all I had. Um, this is the URL where you can uh, find out some more about us or the wine glass picking use case um, I introduced. Thanks for your attention. I think we have 10 minutes for Q and A. Um, so um, yeah, ready, ready to answer your uh, questions about us or anything um, that I mentioned during um, the presentation. And then let's see if I know enough about to give answers. Okay, while we're um, waiting for questions, I can also um, just um, maybe bring up a couple of videos so we're not bored while we're waiting. So I'm going to switch from my presentation to a video. Um, again, essentially just showing off uh, with uh, something you can do now um, with AI and robotics. This is an application um, to This is an application where we needed to follow a very delicate grid structure on a, um, a structure that's made out of carbon. Um, uh, this isn't the full application. The full application is us um, guiding the robot to a point where it would uh, first do um, a very um, tender uh, abrasive grinding. Um, and then there would be put some glue on uh, the structure that uh, you now uh, see uh, in the background uh, of, that, uh, of that video. So this is how the application looks. Um, it's very important that we do not touch uh, this very fragile structure with more than a mutant of force. And uh, the whole thing in reality is like seven meters long. Um, so um, if you touch it only slightly, it will deform and wobble. So attempts to just measure where everything is are doomed. You sort of need to do this dyna dynamically. Um, and that is what we trained the robot to do in this case. Right now you're just looking at a diagram that shows we're really we stay beyond the one Newton of force that we um, may apply to that thing without breaking it. Yeah, and I'll just um, let that, uh, I think there was some noise that may indicate that we have questions and I'll just leave that running in the background while we're 
answering the questions. Yes, Mr. Vu Mr. Wien. Uh, for the moment, we don't have any questions. So, if you can continue with your presentation, I will uh, make okay. sure that uh, we'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll, ju I'll just uh, continue. Um, yes. You know, show, showing 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 some of the of the material that we've done, um, and explain what you what you're looking at. Um, <clears throat> so. Um, yeah, right. Uh, the, the, what we're doing here is we're essentially showing that this um, uh, trained robot pretty much works, um, even if you disturb it massively. And it also would work if you know if you imagine the whole uh, workpiece to be seven meters long. Um, you could imagine putting the robot on wheels and just rolling it up to the workpiece, putting it anywhere, and then you could just start and uh, do the work um, on that uh, grid structure. So again, uh, measuring is completely, you know, wouldn't work uh, in a case like that. Um, so we have no, we don't even have a 3D model um, of that of that work piece. Um, also, there was not a single line of code written. It's really purely um, a, a neural network that has been uh, trained that sits inside our product Mirai that um, creates those uh, dynamic movements uh, to handle that uh, to handle that part. And then um, let me show you something that um, we did for, I think I mentioned this earlier, that we did for a um, factory making refrigerators um, in the south. So let me jump ahead. So I'll... Um, to explain the problem and stop the video and explain the problem uh, when the fridge is uh, delivered. So you're looking at the back end of a refrigerator here and um, you can see, uh, I hope your resolution is good enough, you can see these uh, copper tubes uh, where uh, coolant circulates um, um, in, the, in the refrigerator and it's you know sort of compressed by this compressor um, here. And uh, all these copper tubes have been put in by humans. Uh, just a guy uh, sitting 20 meters to the left uh, of where we're looking at uh, right now. And they have um, uh, put in those copper tubes um, and uh, soldered them um, uh, shut uh, and then put coolant in. And the problem is if one of those uh, solder joints is leaking, then two things happen. First, um, your fridge stops working and this is a high quality fridge. so it's you know, that shouldn't happen. And also your kitchen explodes because uh, the coolant is um, a lighter fluid. So re you really want to make sure that those solder joints um, are uh, in proper order. So what today happens is somebody uses um, a manually led probe. It's like a little artificial nose that you need to bring up to within one millimeter of the solder joints to see if it can sniff out um, any um, coolant molecules in the air around the solder joint. And that's, of course, extremely boring work that nobody wants to do, and people get sloppy after a while. Um, so uh, the factory has uh, tried to robotize this uh, for quite a while, and, uh, and this is essentially the first working solution that has been created through the introduction of trainable AI. So what you see happening here is the, the factory delivers a fridge. It gets stopped in front of the robot. Um, and then these forward movements, as we move those uh, these um, uh, fridging, uh, this sniffing probes towards the solder joints, this movement has been trained uh, using AI, using our product um, to find um, the closest point that the um, uh, sniffing nozzle can get to the solder joint. Um, sometimes it uh, even uh, touches it. The solder joints are always in slightly different places and they always look slightly differently, right? Um, they have been built by hand, depending on who does the soldering, um, they look very corroded or they look super clean or there's a drip, you know, there's a drop of uh, solder fluid on it. Um, so both the position um, of the solder joints uh, varies with like five, you know, within a sphere of like five centimeters. Um, and the look of the solder joint um, uh, really varies and uh, you need to use cameras and AI to pick up where they are and guide the robot there. And that's uh, what we did here. Yeah, that's what the system sees. 
So we're even going around uh, some of those uh, copper tubes uh, in some cases. And again, this has not been you know, custom built for this customer. Um, it has been uh, trained on site in that factory. We weren't involved. Okay, we were involved with helping build a system, but we didn't do the training. The training has mostly been done uh, by local staff that worked in the factory um, and uh, showed uh, by guiding the robot by the wrist how a good movement looks like. And then um, it generally, this is the guy, his name is Siggy. Um, he does the training here. Um, and um, um, our system generalizes over the demonstrations he gave and then knows how to move relative to the fridges depending on uh, what it sees. Okay, let me see if I have one more um, that's interesting enough. Yes, do I have the... No, I don't have the car charging, so I'll just do uh, cable plugging. Oh yeah, need to share the... This is one of the earliest things we did um, where you can also um, quite neatly see the real-time properties of the system. So what we're doing here is we're plugging in um, ethernet cables into a patch panel. Um, of course, the system knows where the cable needs need to go, right? So the AI part is just finding um, the um, insertion point, right? So if you, there's a little slightly off um, when the algorithm drops uh, the robot in front of the point. Uh, of, the, of, the, of the slot that we want to plug in. And then um, uh, the AI takes over uh, the real-time control for uh, making this sort of tender um, um, force uh, responsive plugging in. Again, this is camera driven, um, but uh, even if you have a bit of variance, um, how you know these things are mounted, and even have you a bit, of, even if you have a bit of variance, how the whole 19-inch rack is positioned um, in the actual factory, it came on a Euro pallet, so it was never precisely aligned. Um, you can pick up these cables from uh, from a desk um, where they have been provided, and um, properly and safely uh, insert them to wire a 19-inch rack that goes into. I think a, a data center for, I believe the micro, Microsoft was the customer in this case. Um, and uh, we use this application to demonstrate that, you know, it's actually real time. You can mess with the robot quite badly um, as it uh, moves, right? So we just hit this um, and then uh, it still plugs in. Uh, so you can even, you know, as it moves, try to confuse it. Uh, and it just wants to... Um, get this plug into uh, where it uh, needs to be. And this is what you know the, we, we, we did mostly in the early days, uh, which is confusing and annoying robots. We were always wondering whether they, whether they would fight back at some point. Okay, so I think that um, gives you what I know about uh, the industry where it is and uh, you know, where the, what the interesting fields are um, um, at this point. And it shows you some of the things uh, that are possible today in the fields or in the field uh, uh, robotic arms. Okay, so that really concludes my part, I believe, if there aren't any questions. Right, this is... Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Vuin. Uh, we didn't receive any questions, but thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks for the invitation and uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of a hopefully very inspiring Christian day. <laughs> Thank you, to you too. Uh, for our next presentation, we'll dive deeper into the importance of cybersecurity. Uh, Mr. Jurlind Burdushi and Mr. Robert Schalia will, will be with us in 20 minutes, so stay with us. <laughs>